the channel. All right, so the first things uh, we'll get into is uh, some basics. So I'm going to be referencing this chart. This is from Neil at ASL Academy. You can see the link down below. Um, you go to asl-players.net, you'll find a whole bunch of different stuff. And then this, of course, is the rule book counterexample itself, which you will see in the electronic. And if you have the hard copy, uh, relatively older edition uh, uh, binder, you'll also see on the inside covers the full uh, gun vehicle and MMC examples. So there's a couple things that you should be aware of before we get into the actual vehicles. Um, the first thing is uh, you got to read your chapter H notes for the vehicles. When you ever get a scenario, the first things you're going to do, one of the first things is going to look at the OB. You're going to see what kind of guns, uh, tanks, units, what have you, that you have. And then the onus is on you to do your research on those to make sure that you can use every advantage that you have. Uh, don't depend upon your unit or your opponent to point out mistakes. That's really going to be up to you, especially when you're talking tournament level play and such. Um, don't worry about vehicles that are not in your order of battle. However, the caveat, of course, is your opponent's tanks. You must know what his tanks can do so that if he tries a fast one, you can stop him um, from uh, carrying that out. So when you look at these vehicle notes, specifically, you're looking for the uh, the kill numbers of your weapons. You're looking at the ammo types available for each gun, special equipment that they might be entitled to. Um, you're going to also reference your SSRs for the scenario because they're going to sometimes detail optional equipment. Uh, so all these kind of things you have to factor in before you even sit down at the table. Now, there's plenty of counterexamples and tutorials you're going to find on the web. This is just going to be one of them. Again, I, I pointed to Neil's uh, website and this nice handy-dandy cheat sheet. doesn't cover the information on the back, but that's because it varies by the, the vehicle. Um, there's probably several hundred vehicles in the ASL system and each one sometimes has their own finicky kind of rules and it's not even talking about the nationality specifics so uh, don't be afraid to reference the rulebook and again to hammer home the point you really have to read your chapter H notes on your vehicles all right so with that being said let's start looking at the, um, the vehicles themselves now, uh, as I prefaced in the title of this, it's going to be for starter kit through full ASL. Now, from my understanding of starter kit, which I don't have, I don't play it, but I do have the latest rulebook, uh, current as of, uh, I believe this one is, uh, uh, I think it's 2021, um, current as of. So it has all the way up to module four and it includes PTO as well. So tanks, guns, and all that are included in here. Uh, so that's what I'm going to be referencing. Now, the, um, the Star Kit only deals with two kinds of vehicles. One is the oval underneath the moving point here. Let me use a, a marker here. You can see this oval here. Uh, that means it's a fully tracked vehicle. And the other one is a single circle white which denotes an armored car. So these are the only two vehicles that exist in starter kit. Either you're fully tracked or you're an armored car. None of the other ones exist. Um, when you get the full ASL, you're going to have to jump into four more. Uh, and they're going to be uh, the motorcycles. You got the half tracks, which uh, obviously are used for uh, uh, troop carry like this. You have trucks and you have a variety of trucks. And uh, this also includes Jeeps and basically any other wheeled vehicles. Um, and finally, there's going to be air sledges. Now, air sledges are a new one. They came out in Hakapale, the, uh, the Finnish module. And they're going to be, uh, they were primarily used, from my understanding, in the Winter War with Finland and Russia. So aside from those kind of scenarios, you're probably not going to see them. But uh, they do exist as an option, and they're at the back of the chapter D chapter in full ASL. All right, so let's start digging into the counters. Now, again, if you have Neil's cheat sheet or the uh, counter examples from the rule book, by all means, pull those out, follow along. You really have to understand this if you want to get a grasp of vehicles. Uh, vehicles obviously come with inherent. 
Now there's exceptions to this course is you could have armor leaders potentially, in which case you would use their abilities. So for example, if we pull up a, um, let's pull up a German armor leader. Say we're lucky enough to have a 10-2 on this martyr. He would use his 10 morale for any kind of morale check based attacks that the AFE would take. On the other side, we have inexperienced. Say for whatever reason, this uh, Panther has a, some bizarre reason, has an inexperienced crew. It's effectively treated as a six up one, right? So that's the morale. Now, when it comes to crew survival, again, most vehicles have some kind of crew survival, but there's a couple things you gotta look at. And I kind of just learned this myself relatively recently. First of all, you have uppercase CS and you have lowercase CS. The difference being that this case here, for example, this Sherman would have a crew survival of six. So that means the inherent crew, provided they um, you don't know, flame the tank, uh, they'll have a chance of survival if they roll a six or less. You contrast that with something like a truck where it's lowercase. This means that there's never going to be inherent crew. It's only ever going to be for the passengers and riders on those vehicles. So that applies to gliders, it applies to trucks, uh, transport, that kind of stuff. You look at this half track here, for example, it has uppercase crew survival, which means this half track would allow the crew a chance to live. Again, provided you don't cause a blaze. If you cause a blaze, uh, the crew is killed automatically. Uh, another thing to brought the crew survival is the red number. Again, we're going to get into this later on with the to hits. But when it comes to rolling for a kill number because of the type of vehicle, construction, maybe there's uh, too much flammable materials around, that kind of thing, uh, you're basically going to be deducting one from any to kill shot. So when it comes to causing burns, you're more likely to cause a flaming wreck with a red CS than with not. Now, when it comes to um, your cruise itself, basically you have two statuses. Right, you have buttoned up and you have crew exposed. Now, again, we're going to get into the counters in a second, but basically we're going to use these two counters here to represent that. You have a crew exposed, which you can also button up. Obviously, this is only used for turreted vehicles. However, when it comes to things like a, uh, a martyr, which is open topped, and your crew exposed, you want to go buttoned up, you would put a counter like this on top of it. Now, again, normally with open top, you have to be crew exposed in order to fire. So just remember uh, how those are used. If for whatever reason you want to hunker down, maybe there's not time for a good shot, you want to save your crew, uh, you're going to depend on your armor, not on their morale, um, you might want to button up. But just be aware of that just two statuses, buttoned up and crew exposed. All right. Now, when it comes to vehicle status changing it, you can only do it once in a movement phase and once in the advanced phase, but you cannot do it twice. So for example, when you're moving into some enemy's line of fire, uh, you want to go hatches down, you want to get close enough. And when it's your turn to fire, you want to go hatches up. You can't do that in the same phase. You can only do it once in the movement phase for free or once in the advanced phase for free. It doesn't cost any move to go hatches up or down, but you cannot do both in the same phase. All right, so let's look at movement points. Now, um, again, we have several examples here. And what we're going to look at first is the normal one. So typically, you're going to have a black movement points. Remember, vehicles use movement points. Infantry use movement factors. So we have 14 MP for the Sherman, um, 14 for this little T27 tankette. And you notice that it has a red number. Red numbers mean you have a chance of mechanical breakdown at start so because most of your vehicles will be um, uh, motionless when you start the scenario unless you enter from off board uh, you're going to have to start your vehicle to move it when you try and roll uh, make a start roll all you do is you just roll a couple dice and provided you don't roll crap um, you're able to carry out normally should you roll at 12 then you're going to uh, immobilize your vehicle. You burnt out the engine, you pop in some pistons, what have you. Um, it's just uh, the engine's broken down and your tank is now immobilized. Now, when it comes to things like special vehicles, you're going to see sometimes 
deviations from the norm. In this case, we have a Panther 5D, which is the early war model. And so the engines were not as reliable. So in this case, uh, you can see what's going to happen if you roll a 12, 11, or a 10. All right, so a stall is just that. You, you burn delay points before you can start. Immobilized means you've burned your vehicle. Or, sorry, uh, you've blown the engine. And the burn means your vehicle just got toasted. Um, and you probably don't have a chance of crew survival. That's how um, risk, risky these vehicles were at the start. Now, some vehicles, uh, you can see this Duck W. It has a small little superscript. In this case, a, a three. In which case, you're allowed to use some other kind of movement. Typically, vehicles are designed for land. However, things like a duck are amphibious, which means they can also move in the water at that rate that's listed in the superscript. So, again, you have basically three kinds of movement. You have forward, you have reverse, and you have something like amphibious or some variation thereof. So, of those three different movement types, uh, they're each going to require you to expand movement points. Um, when it comes to reverse movement, um, again, you have to announce this at the start. Uh, it's going to cost you uh, one to go into reverse motion status as your start. You basically go from a stop to a, a reverse motion status, and then it's going to cost you a variable amount of movement points to enter in the hex behind you. Um, typically for tracks, it's four, trucks are three, and armored cars are two. Although sometimes, again, you must read the back of your counters. You have things like this here, for example, this uh, PSW221 armored car has a reverse of four, which means it costs four times, not two as per normal. So there's Italian armored cars that have the same kind of thing. All right, so that's reverse movement. Now, if you want to change from forward motion to rearward motion, you must spend a movement point to stop. Then you must spend a movement point to start up in reverse motion before you move. So you can't just stop your vehicle and quickly back up. You must ensure you have enough uh, movement points to carry out what you want to do with it. Uh, looking at armor types. There's to work. Uh, there's basically four types of armor in the game. Um, there's the unarmored um, vehicles, like these trucks. They have stars instead of armor factors. Like this. Oh, that's the wrong color. Uh, you have partially armored, in which case you may have a vehicle like this Martyr where the front half of the vehicle is armored, but the rear is not. So in that case, you can see a small little star with a T. That indicates that it is partially armored, and the rear target facing upper superstructure is therefore unarmored. So if you fire into the back and you get a hull hit, you're going to be hitting this one armored factor. If you get a turret hit, you're, fighting, uh, you're shooting into an unarmored uh, location. So obviously um, when it comes to using these kind of tanks you want to make sure that you think about being flanked when you apply them. There's also uh, two types of other types. One is the open-topped silhouette. So here you can see this uh, armored car again. It is open-topped which means you're always going to be crew exposed unless you declare you're buttoned up. Um, Usually you have to be crew exposed to fire to main armament or anti-air. And the other one is the closed top silhouette, your typical tank. All right, now these are closed top. Um, typically they're buttoned up until you declare your CE status. You might want to use CE status when you're doing long road moves, for example, because you get the bonuses on the road. However, when it comes close to being with the enemy and getting about to engage, you want to make sure you go hatches down just so that they don't have a, uh, a chance of impacting your crew. Again, like a close top silhouette, or sorry, like the open topped, you must be crew exposed to fire any anti-air. So uh, in this case here again, the Sherman, we have a four anti-air machine gun. In order to fire that, we must be crew exposed. Now there's some variations of vehicles they have, especially in uh, Russian vehicles, they might have remote fired capability. Uh, 
sometimes we're, we're facing. But again, these are special cases why you must go into Chapter H so you can understand this. Um, as I said, when you're on a road, you want to be crew exposed generally just because you get the road bonus. However, when it comes to being close to the enemy, like I said, you want to go hatches down because road bonus doesn't do you any good if your crew takes a hit. You're going to be especially vulnerable because uh, crew exposed usually gives you a plus two terrain effect modifier. Now, there are a couple of exceptions. There's some American half tracks that because of their up armored frontal shields give you a plus three. And that's through the frontal arc. Uh, through the back, they will be uh, covered by the plus two. But typically, you're going to get a plus two TM if your crew exposed. And you're also going to be vulnerable to small arms fire because if your hatch is down, um, you cannot be impacted by small arms fire. <clears throat> you can be impacted by machine gun fire if they fire on the uh, uh, tank, um, TT, uh, tank target type. Jesus, I can't even think. If you're firing on the tank target type, then um, you have a chance of impacting a low-armored vehicle with a machine gun. But typically, crews are going to be immune to any kind of small arms fire. So that's why you want to sometimes avoid or be judicious when you apply your crew exposed status. Uh, final note, basically any uh, vehicle that has armor factors, even one that has zeros, a little tank yet, even though it has zeros for armor factor, it's still considered an armored fighting vehicle and therefore it's not vulnerable to uh, small arms fire. You must use something bigger than a, or a machine gun or something bigger to have a hope of penetrating that. All right, let's look at armor factors. Now, there are basically five target sizes and they go in ascending order and uh, the modifiers are appropriate. So for very small is a plus two. For small is a plus one to hit. Normal is obviously nothing. Large will be a minus one, and very large would be a minus two to hit. So obviously the bigger vehicles, like a Panther, has a red 18 here, which means it's going to be a minus one to hit. Conversely, you look at this small little truck, or Jeep, and it's got two white stars, which indicates it's a very small target, and therefore it's going to be a plus two to hit. Right, so uh, you must understand that um, anything with a white background, like this tankette, is a very small target. When you start getting into the red numbers, like the King Tiger, for example, or the KV-2 is a good example, you're going to have two red numbers, which, because it's so large, it's going to be that much easier to hit. You may not pen it, but it's going to be very much easier to hit. Now, when it comes to hit location for any ordnance, I always mess this one up. Uh, for some reason, I just can't grok this. But when you roll a two-hit roll, so let's look at this one here. We'll roll a uh, uh, an eight. Um, turret hits would be if the color die is less than the white, which is less likely than it being a hull hit, which case it has to be equal to or greater than the white die. Now, the exception to this, of course, is critical hit. You normally need snake eyes to get a critical hit using the tank target type. And therefore, the um, if you're hull down status, typically that would indicate a hull hit. Well, if you're hull down, you're immune to any hull hits. However, if you roll a critical hit, it's always considered a hit, uh, even if you're hull down. So just remember the exception, critical hits always count versus hull down targets. Again, typically you're going to need snake eyes. Now, when it comes to armor factor ratings, you can see them all listed here. And then below that, you can see the aerial armor factors. Typically, the... Um, Um, aerial armor factors are going to be used for things like aircraft, obviously. Uh, if you have underbelly fire, and we're going to get into that with one of the examples, basically as you're cresting a ridge or a, a gully or a wadi or something, and the enemy's within a certain range, they can fire at your much softer underbelly and have a better chance of killing you. Uh, also, AT mines and DC um, work as well. Um, that's typically where your armor, your aerial factors are. So these are zero to four and armor factors go, uh, it's not a, 
steady or this is a weird jump 8 to 11 but basically when it comes to armor what we're going to be looking at is whether or not they have a circle like this or they have a square all right circles are always going to be uh, weaker upper superstructure squares are going to be stronger upper superstructure so whenever you see a circle and a square uh, you're going to see the uh, armor factor go up one or down one all right so um we basically have five turret types to deal with we have the no turret like this tankette we have a one-man turret like this armored car we have a restricted slow traverse uh i don't have an example here uh thick white box basically it's the same kind as this it just has the complete white box you have a slow traverse like this panther and then you have a fast traverse again like the sherman so when you have the thin white circle it's fast traverse typically you're going to see these kinds of three tanks as well as the um, uh, no turret one uh they're going to impact your to hit rolls is the reason why you have to worry about that because if you look at the tables um we look at our fire base if you want to fire outside of your covered arc you're going to have to pay based on the tur type all right so there's broken down into three there's other modifiers of course but depending on the turret of your vehicle might determine uh how you apply it whether or not you want to risk um, gaining motion status and flipping your whole vehicle or just pivoting your turret, depending on your modifiers. Um, we're looking at next is ground pressure. Now, this only applies for bog die rolls. Uh, you have three kinds of ground pressure. You have a square, you have nothing, and then you have a circle. All right, so a circle is going to be high ground pressure. Normal will typically be a plus one to your bog. And if you have a square, it means you have low ground pressure. We're going to have uh, MGs. Again, I know this is coming at you kind of fast, but uh, if you keep referencing your manuals and the chapter H notes, this is all going to come to you rather quickly. And again, I'm going to parse these out into individual segments so that it's not just three hours of me blabbing. When it comes to machine guns, they're always listed in this order. You have your bow, your coax, and then you have your anti-air um, machine gun. If you ever see something like this here where you have a minus, let's zoom into that. Uh, you see this minus beside the two? That means in this case that this T60 does not have a BMG. It only has a coax. Uh, another case here, for example, this armored car, or excuse me, this um, um, Jesus truck, if you want to call it that, uh, Jeep, has um, no bow, has a coax, and it has a little asterisk. Again, whenever you see an asterisk besides any of your vehicles, for example, the Sherman 3, you can see the star beside the 75, you have to look at the back because it's going to give you more information. Any BMG that you see that's going to have a white background, I don't think I have an example here, will mean that it is a fixed mount. Now that's going to penalize you when it comes to shooting it, um, especially at moving targets. You're going to have an add a plus one to your machine gun IFT roll whenever you're trying to shoot at a moving target. That's because it's pimple mounted, it doesn't uh, move, it just fires straight in the vehicle covered arc. Um, all right, so let's jump to the important parts, I think, besides armor factor are the ordnance. What kind of gun main armament are you carrying? Now, you're always gonna use the ordnance rules, so if you're familiar with chapter C in full ASL, or the equivalent in starter kit, then the same applies to your guns um, on vehicles. The only difference is, is your vehicle is much more mobile. You have the option of moving and shooting in the same phase. Typically, guns are not going to have that kind of capability. 
Uh, so the same rules apply for special ammunition. Again, if you look at the back of the counter, you're going to see everything that's allowed to fire. So in this case, we have uh, smoke mortars, we have smoke, and we have APCR available in 44 and 45. All right, um, we look at this martyr. We have a smoke discharger. We have smoke. We have heat, uh, excuse me, HE. Uh, when it comes to superscripts around special ammunition, these refer to the year. All right, so we have 42, 43, and 44. And if you ever see a letter like here, we have a J4. That refers to the month followed by the year. So in this case, we have June 44. Once more, if you look in your vehicle notes, you see that it's June, not July or January. Um, some things like September, obviously, would be a lot easier to get. But uh, in cases like this, again, I just refer you to your Chapter H notes. Now, some vehicles, which I don't have an example here, have secondary armaments. So let's bring one in. Uh, let's bring in the Grant. Uh, so here we can see we have two guns. We have a 37 double long. That's in your turret. And we have a um, bow-mounted 75 millimeter uh, short muzzle, or not short muzzle, just a 75. That's mounted in the hull. So normally you're allowed to fire both guns. In cases like this, you want to be specific about what you fire because the first gun that fires will get the acquisition. If you mistakenly fire the wrong one, you're going to acquire with the wrong gun. And this may come very crucial. Uh, so just bear that in mind. Again, look at your notes. Um, when it comes to gun types on vehicles, you're going to see this. You normally don't see this in your guns. On vehicles, you will. You're going to have things like an overscored size or potentially an underscored size. All that means is... Uh, if it's underscored, it can only fire AP, limited turret storage space that did not carry any uh, HE. And if it's overscored, then it can only fire AP, does not care, or excuse me, you have reversed. If it's overscored, it can only fire HE. So here we have um, an assault gun, SE-122, which can only fire HE. It is capable of firing heat. And when it comes to breakdown, it typically, like in most guns, it's going to break down on a 12. However, some vehicles will have a breakdown. Uh, like uh, this one here has a breakdown of 11. Or it could have a breakdown that's circled. Now, this gets a little bit confusing. Basically, a circled breakdown number means the AFE might be subject to low ammunition. That happens when you roll um, this number or higher. Uh, so if you roll an 11, you're going to have a low ammo counter. If you roll a 12, the gun is going to be mouthed as well as having a low am ammo counter. Once that happens, so let's put an ammo counter on him. All right, so here we have a low ammo counter on this uh, SU-100. And um, therefore, what happens is, is this circled breakdown number is reduced by 1. And this now becomes a new malfunction number. So once we have a low ammo counter, this SE-100, if he rolls an 11 or 12, the gun is uh, broken. And if he rolls a 10, uh, so you want to be careful with your guns with a circled breakdown number. Once they start running into low ammo, again, to most scenarios, you're not going to worry about this because the time span is so short, it may not really play. However, if this is a linchpin to your defenses, or you're doing something like Festung Budapest where ammunition shortage is an issue, then uh, having low ammo counters is really going to hinder your uh, effectiveness, obviously. All right, so um, let's look at the gun types. Now, like most ordnance, you're going to have three types. You're going to have, well, I guess you're going to have four types. You're going to have unmarked. You're going to have short muzzle or high muzzle velocity which is going to be an L, and you also could have a very high muzzle velocity, which is a double L. And again, those play into things when you're shooting, when you're rolling to hit. You can look here where the, uh, uh, the gun type is. You have your short muzzle or your low muzzle velocity, your high muzzle, and your very high muzzle velocity, and it obviously is going to impact your shots. Again, something you must be aware of when you're looking at your orders of battle 
is the uh, ordnance type um, that you're going to be using. So when it comes to longer range shots, clearly you're not going to be trying to do too much with your uh, low muzzle velocity. However, if that's all you have, maybe you fire some area and uh, you, you have to work with what you have. Uh, two other points when it comes to main armaments, and that is Infantry Firepower Equivalent, or IFE, and that is represented by a number in brackets. So here we have a 6 on the ZIS-42. Um, this uh, T-60 also has an IFE of 4, as well as a coax of 2. So... With IFE, you can combine the two into one attack. So in this case, you would have a six firepower attack. Uh, one thing you must bear in mind is range limitations. Obviously, remember, bow MGs only have an 8 hex range, whereas your coax has a 12 hex range. So uh, you're basically uh, going to be penalized if you fire beyond 12 hexes in this case. Um, whenever you use your IFE capability, your rate of fire drops by one. So in this case, if we use our IFE, then we lose our rate of fire. If we have this one here, for example, we use our IFE, we only have two rate of fire nowadays, now, and so therefore you must make that if you want to continue firing. You also don't have to make any kind of to hit roll, it's straight on the IFT, so it's, it's quite handy. Uh, typically, you're going to see a lot of anti-aircraft vehicles or armored half-tracks, especially in Stalingrad. On the German side, you're going to have a lot of vehicles like that that have uh, really high IFEs and um, can be quite impactful depending, obviously, on what you're shooting at. Uh, the last thing we'll talk about with main armament is multiple hit. Now, what, this ha what happens here is... Whenever you have a gun between 15 and 40 millimeter, uh, and you roll doubles, so if uh, we roll doubles here, let's get a doubles. There we go, we had a two. So let's roll this four here. Um, this would allow me to make two rolls, provided it's not a critical hit, to... Um, and I get to pick which one. So it's obviously because uh, it's a small caliber gun, it's firing more quickly. You're going to get more pen shots and you have a better chance of penetrating uh, with obviously multiple hits. So in this case here, um, let's roll two to kills. We can pick the six. If you have a critical hit, uh, doubles does not apply. Uh, the multiple hit capability doesn't apply. Now, when it comes to multiple hits, again, your first die roll will determine where you hit on the vehicle. Most vehicles, well, actually every vehicle, can carry riders. Uh, typically, you might be confined by nationality, depending on what's going on. Um, but uh, any vehicle is capable of carrying riders. Something like a truck can carry passengers, or a half-track, excuse me, they're a half-track. You can carry passengers. Um, those are the basically the two kinds of portage capacity vehicles you have. So when it comes to something like a duck, you have a 29 portage points and basically a squad is 10. You have to start adding in support weapons and leaders and such, you quickly uh, max out. So in this case, we can carry two squads, a couple of leaders, maybe a medium or uh, even a couple of lights and then we'd be maxed out. You cannot exceed this portage point capacity. Uh, we're not one of those jangle buses like you see <laughs> where you have people living on the roof and such. You can't do that. You have to stay within the limits of what your vehicle can carry. When it comes to towing capacity, uh, we're looking for things like this um, truck right here. We have a T-4. Here we have a T-8. Here's a T-10. So what that means is any manhandling number of this, that number or higher. So if you have something light like a, um, let's bring in a gun for the British. Here we have an M12. That could be carried by the gas. All right, let's bring in a uh, 76 double long. This requires a vehicle to carry it, which has, must be 
uh, this number or greater. So we cannot use the gas, we cannot use the 67B, we can only use something like the IAG6. All right, so we must be able to be this number of the towing capacity or greater in order to carry it. Obviously, the bigger or as smaller this number is, the larger it is, more harder it is to manhandle. Uh, so that's basically uh, the nutshell of vehicles. Now let's look at some special capabilities. Now, most of these capabilities will only be available if it's A on the counter and B if it's specified by SSR, something like that. Typically, that comes into things like Scherzen and gyro stabilization, these two right here. Um, you, these need to be specified in SSR that they're equipped. Otherwise, it just remains an option and you don't necessarily have it. However, when it comes to smoke dispensers, that you will have if the back of the counter carries it. All right. Uh, not that. Uh, where are we here? Here we go. All right, so uh, when it comes to smoke dispensers, again, what they typically do is drop a plus two white dispersed smoke in your hex. Uh, the one exception to that is the smoke mortar, in which case you place it up to three hexes away. Um, so in this case here, we have a smoke mortar with the Sherman of a usage number of eight. Provided we make that usage number, we can drop smoke anywhere up to three hexes away. Whereas this smoke discharger on the Panther has a usage number of five and will only drop it inside that hex. Now you can uh, only do that once per movement phase. So you can't just leave a string of smoke um, hexes as you're driving along. You can only do it once and it costs you one movement point to fire that. So again, you must have available number of movement points. To do what you want to do including popping smoke now as we said there's going to be four types so you have the smoke discharger which is basically a turret with little uh, uh, launchers on it which fills the area you have a smoke mortar which as we said can project it up to three hexes away then you have smoke pots typically this is the crew taking a smoke grenade smoke pot what have you dumping it outside the hatch to represent that so you must be CE to do that. And then we have the uh, German combat uh, shotgun, we call it the Navratide Gungswaffe, um, which you must use buttoned up. Basically, it's like a claymore strapped to the outside of the vehicle. Um, in any other phase but the close combat, it puts down plus two white dispersed smoke. In the close combat, you can actually get a 16 firepower attack on the IFT in close combat. So. Uh, when you see SN in any kind of vehicles, like the Tigers, um, maybe the Panther or uh, the Mark IVs, then you really got to worry about if you're going to get into close combat range and take that in the face, because that's going to hurt. Uh, two other types of special equipment, optional equipment, I should say, are Scherzen, which is only available to the Germans, and Gyros. Typically, Americans and lend lease vehicles might have gyros. Gyros are symbolized by a G on the back of the counter. And Scherzen, uh, I don't have an example here. There's one in the Stug. Let's bring that up. Actually, let's look at the Panth um, Mark IV. Yeah, see, we have his uh, SZ over here. That means that this vehicle is capable of having Scherzen. Again, provided SSR dictates it. Or if you're doing design your own, you've paid the applicable price for that kind of thing. Now, the benefit of Scherzen, basically, it's armor plates are run on the sides of your vehicle and on the hull. On the turret, it's only on the sides and the back. And all it does is prevent or it helps you against heat ammunition. So high explosive anti-tank or shaped charge weapons, that kind of stuff. Um, typically, the Scherzen are exterior plates bolted onto the vehicle. The round hits that and explodes before it hits the actual arm of the vehicle itself. That's the concept, and that's why you only have them on the sides and on the rear of the turret. But again, it's only available if it's specified in SSR or you've paid the price. Uh, similar with gyro stabilized. Um, 
really handy. Typically, you're only going to see those in those fast kind of turrets like this one here. And it lets you use, um, it gives you better chance of firing while you're on the move. You can retain acquisition even if you're non-stop. Normally, once you move a gun or a vehicle, you lose any acquisition it had. If it's driver stabilized, you don't. Um, even if you're non-stopped, and uh, we're going to cover that later on with non-stopped, stopped, motion, uh, not in motion, all that means. Because um, they all mean different things and it could get quite confusing. So we're going to cover that later on when it gets to the examples. Uh, one other thing about gyros. So if you have, for example, here the Sherman again, we have a coax here. Um, normally you have your firepower, your, your machine guns, when you're doing bounding fire. However, because your turret is gyro stabilized, your gun platform, usually the machine gun is in line with that, um, it shares that capability. So that basically means you don't have uh, your coax, only the coax for bounding fire. 